I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. I regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. The world is changing, and it's up to us to figure out which direction it is going. Because it is people like you and people like me that are going to make the change today. No human being should have to face the indignity and injustice of digging through the trash can to find their next meal. Sanitation is a basic human right. A right each and every individual is entitled to. Helping is a human act of compassion. The enemy is hunger, not the hungry. In my country, clean water is a luxury. Enquanto muitas pessoas desperdiçam água, poucas pessoas têm acesso à água limpa. Tantangan terbesar kita adalah sifat apatis. So now I leave it up to you to make that choice that you have. Don't let it slip through your fingers. A feeling doesn't feed a hungry person. We need to turn our feelings into action. Today, I am hopeful. Today, I am Elijah King, and this is my dream. So, <laughs> Welcome, and many thanks to our friends at Unilever for sharing that video with us. I think it captures the exuberance and energy that young voices bring to social change, so I was Glad to be able to start the session with it. Um, and that is the inspiration for our session today. So I'm Kristen Gillis from the Malago Foundation. Malago invests in organizations that address basic needs of the very poor. We are known for being unabashedly obsessed with impact and scale. And perhaps because of that obsession, I'm moderating the panel with eight speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'm really glad that you're all here on Friday afternoon. We were a little worried about our speaker to audience member ratio. Um, and so there will be eight speakers on stage today, nine heartbeats, technically. <laughs> um, and actually, because I have this lovable parasite growing inside of me, I was really excited to have a chance to host a session that's about youth. Because I think so often at conferences and in the news, Youth is framed as an issue um, or as a ticking time bomb. And that isn't our frame today. That's really relevant when you're talking about the youth bulge and growing unemployment. But today, in this room at least, youth is not a problem we need to solve. It is an opportunity to change the world. So we're going to hear from four young voices who have aspirations to do just that. They're already changing their community. They're focused on changing their country and even their continent. Uh, this is the first time for all four of them at the School World Forum, and I was just promising them that there's no one in the room who is opposed to young leaders. <laughs> um, but if you are, I hope you reveal yourself during the Q&A at the end. <laughs> um, and we can have a good discussion about it. Uh, so we'll hear from them first, and then we also have three young at heart, but less young, luminaries in the field of youth leadership and social entrepreneurship that will talk about how they've dedicated their careers to nurturing youth with the skills and gaps that they need to actually achieve those lofty dreams. So that's a lot in 75 minutes, so we want to get started. Our first young voice is Misan Rwane. She joins us from Lagos, Nigeria. Misan took her Stanford Economics and Harvard Business School degree and her work experience in consulting, and analyzed market opportunities to um, tackle youth unemployment in Africa. So she now leads a young organization called WAVE, West Africa Vocational Education. Um, and her leadership has already led to recognition with fellowships from Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, Echoing Green, Aspen New Voices, Cordes Foundation, and Malago. So, Masan, show everyone why. <laughs> okay. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, as a kid growing up in the 80s in Lagos, Nigeria, heavily influenced by Western pop culture, it was seen as cool to have a short name, or at least a shortened version of your traditional four to five syllable Nigerian name. <laughs> so you can imagine a rosemary would always trump an Ogene Karo. <laughs> or a Diana would always be cooler than an Olua Simisola. <laughs> so I was blessed enough to have a shortened version of my longer name, Origo Misan, which was simply Misan. Just like the car, Nissan, but with an M and one S. Yes, I put a lot of thought into that growing up. <laughs> Um, but sometimes I would face the awkward follow-up question, which would be, well, what kind of name is Misan? Or what's the full name? Or what does it mean? And I would have to awkwardly respond that my name meant, my head is good. <laughs> Literally. Ori means head, me means mine, and Osan means it is good. Origo Misan. And then I would awkwardly change the subject and move on, having exposed myself. Um, so one day I asked my grandmother, why my late grandfather had chosen to name me Origo Misa. After all, my sister had named after my grandmother, my brother was named after my grandfather, and I was this awkward middle one. And she smiled in that wise way that only grannies do, and she explained to me that my grandfather had intended the name as a prayer, as a prophecy, that my head is good means that my destiny will be good. Over the years, I have grown to cherish and appreciate that meaning behind my name. That my destiny will be good has become my prayer, my belief, not just for me, but for my country, for my motherland, Africa, and for young people around the world. And I have an obligation to live up to that name. It's been really a unique experience over the past few days meeting so many people with such big dreams. Big dreams that are gonna change the world in remarkable ways. And some of them already working on their way to achieving those dreams. But on the other side of the world, where I come from, there are millions, literally tens of millions of young people who share similar dreams of making their mark on the world. But what they do not share is the same access to achieve those dreams. I want to change that. Through my organization, WAVE, West Africa Vocational Education, we're working to identify self-motivated and underserved youth, training them in 21st century employability skills that employers tell us matter, communication, teamwork, negotiation skills, ethics, problem solving, and we are placing them in entry-level jobs in high-growth industries. And by the way, these are things that you all learn in school, but we aren't as fortunate because of our education system. Young people, like 23-year-old Paul Anigoro, who came to our program in August 2013 and joined our first cohort, desperate for a job. We admitted Paul based on his determination to succeed and his willingness to learn. He embraced our three-week intensive program learning problem-solving skills, customer service, and the most important skill which will serve him in the future, the ability to learn. And within weeks, Paul was placed in a job, and next week we'll be celebrating his 18th month anniversary, working at one of the top international hotels in Lagos. Paul has also enrolled part-time in a local polytechnic where he now studies graphic designs in the evenings and the weekends because of the shift nature of his job. My hope for a better world is one in which young people like Paul are equipped with the skills, with the economic opportunity, and most importantly, with the mindset to drive their own destinies. I still introduce myself as Misan today, but I smile now when asked about my name, and sometimes will volunteer it unasked that I am Miss San Rawane and my name, which means my destiny will be good, is important to me. 
Because as I fulfill my own destiny, I am putting other people on the path to shaping their own. Thank you. Come back, come back, come back. <laughs> Good job. So, okay, so you asked us very beautifully to think about the meaning of a name. And you chose West Africa Vocational Education, not just Lagos, not even just Nigeria, which I'm sure you know would be a lot of people. <laughs> um, tell us how and why you believe that WAVE will go from a project that served 100 people last year to actually address youth unemployment in West Africa? Great question. Um, what's in a name, like you said? Um, for me, it was important that this vision, that this dream was not just limited to Nigeria. It wasn't limited to the people in the room who are all West Africans, but was something that would be scalable, replicable across West Africa and across the world. I've had friends in South Africa say, hey, come and set up a save. Or people in East Africa, come and set up an Eve or the Nave in the North Africa. And, and what we really believe is that our model um, of low cost, affordable vocational training linked to jobs is enough, is, is, is enough and is applicable across the world to plug young people, re-educate them in what employers tell us matter. And that is constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. And that is why that conversation and the connection with employers is important. But connecting them to the market um, is something that we believe can actually change, not just the face of Africa, but the face of how young people are educated and plugged into the economies globally. So what do you think, I, I feel like I hear people talk about the problem of youth unemployment and the youth bulge a lot more than solutions to it. So do you think there are other solutions out there or are you our only hope? Which by the way, I would feel pretty good about. <laughs> there are several solutions out there. Um, I used to run a blog um, where we would just talk about the problems and I shut it down one day just out of frustration. Um, and, and to be honest, fear coming to conferences and forums because of that aspect of really talking about the problems, which is why I find this, this forum very, very um, special and unique because we are speaking about solutions. There are several solutions out there. Even just in the last three days, I've come across so many other people working with young people who are learning and adapting and replicating and sharing and spreading their curricula, sharing their methodology of how they're doing this. So I am truly blessed to be in this space with change makers um, and learning from them. It's a very collaborative space and that's one thing that has impressed me as my first full-time endeavor um, in the social sector. I, I've been very overwhelmed and, and blessed with how sharing and how collaborative this space is. It's a different idea of competition. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I have one last question. So one of the things we wanted to talk about was skill gaps and training that young people need to succeed. So what do you feel like is still the biggest skill gap that you want to address for WAVE to succeed? The biggest skill gap, I think, is young people not knowing how to think. The education system is just not teaching us how to think for ourselves. It's telling us what to think, it's telling us what to regurgitate. Um, young people are faced with not knowing how to solve problems in their own personal life, and therefore they graduate and they cannot solve problems for employers, which is all an employer wants you to do, to be honest. You cannot solve problems for your employer, you cannot solve problems for your nation. And so I honestly think that problem solving, which is critical thinking, is the biggest missing, missing skill in the gap. And what about for yourself, for leading WAVE? Hmm. <laughs> um, I was telling someone, um, it really is the humility to listen to people and ask for help. Insane. Strong, proud African women struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Lisa. <laughs>
a dream come true to be at school um, today. It is a, it is a miracle. Uh, first, because I get to tell my family that um, I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, there's actually millions of dreamers, not, not millions, but many dreamers um, that are working for social change and for a better world that inspire me to do what we do at Fundación Paraguaya. I am, my name is Jimena and I am from Paraguay. And in our country, we face a big dilemma. Our economy is constantly growing, but still, at least 23% of our population is living in poverty. So people like us still face another dilemma. What can we do? How can we solve this problem? Sometimes um, you can make a plan, but other times things just happen and you can reach and take that opportunity. Um, in 2004, there was a big fire in my country. Um, it killed about at least 400 people in one of Asuncion's poorest neighborhood. Uh, it was a shock for everyone, but it was also a time where I learned that we could not stand still. We needed to do something to create change. I got involved in, a, in, in the community. I had the opportunity to, ascend, uh, to attend a relief program with UNICEF called the Return to Happiness, where from, for one month, we work with kids from the neighborhood to change and to work in the process of going from grieving to happiness, to go back to that happiness. Um, so working with the children, very, getting very close with families, I also became a little frustrated because um, I was 14 at the time. So, um, and for, for like five years, I stayed very involved with the community. So I would raise whatever little money I could. I will like take my um, school supplies and try, to, and try to give them to them, tutor the students um, in, the, in the afternoons. But it seemed like anything I did was not enough. Or, or the, even though I could see that the family wanted to be better, I could see that the family wanted to change their living conditions, things were still not changed. Something bigger was necessary to, to see that change. I wasn't strong enough or wasn't capable enough of unleashing that potential of, of, of that family. So I had the great opportunity to go to the US and get a degree in social work because I was convinced that I wanted to work um, with these families and make a difference. By going away, um, it was a wonderful opportunity, but it was really by coming back that I was able to discover um, the next step forward. I found... Um, I, a wonderful place to work that is Fundación Paraguaya. And literally on my first day at, the, at work, I read the mission and it said, um, we dream of a Paraguay that is entrepreneurial and poverty free, um, an example for the world. I was like, are you kidding me? That's exactly what I wanna do. That's exactly where I wanna be doing. Um, is this place really exists in Paraguay where I thought everything was hopeless and we couldn't really do anything about my little community? Um, so this um, working here, I learned that it is possible to, um, to create that change, to inspire families to have a very living condition. Um, with our program, The Poverty Stop, like, we are trying to redefine the way we look at poverty, trying to change the way families, um, the way we interact with families, having them as a main protagonist in their action plans, um, getting back the power so that they can self um, can um, take that potential and eliminate poverty. Um, we're all, only a small part, it is the families that are doing all the work. So I am honored and very passionate to be able to share all this with you. I'm honored and very passionate to be working and seeing the real change day to day um, through unleashing families' potential, helping them identify what are their needs and how can we change them. Uh, finding the right type of motivations, we can change a woman in the middle of Kuruwatu, uh, from this bathroom to this bathroom in a matter of um, two weeks, because we're finding the right weights. And, and as our executive director Martina always says, like maybe money is not so much the problem, is how do we unleash the potential that is trapped within the families so that they can come out and, and, and develop by themselves. Thank you. So I want to ask you a couple of questions too. One is, um, you talked about 
early on feeling powerless and mm -hmm. frustrated that there wasn't a way that you knew how to create the change you wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And yet later you joined an organization with a long history of excellence, mm -hmm. which is an incredible opportunity, but also means that that organization has a way of doing things exactly. already. So how as a young person did you join an organization that's really a big NGO mm -hmm. um, without feeling frustrated? How did you find your place there? Um, I think that um, frustration can actually be a strength um, because by going outside and then coming to Paraguay, okay, what am I going to do next? Um, I, I was just... Um, so passionate and, and, and like trying to find out a place that will let me, and with all this excitement, be able to work. Um, and it's by joining that I, that I was able to, to, to really um, under, better understand what it took to, to create these changes. Um, so, so yes, I think, yeah. okay, go, ahead. go ahead. So I think it's like the frustration inspired me to, to find a place. And maybe it was a little bit of luck too. Um. <laughs> luck too. And um, one of the good things about joining an organization like that is that mm -hmm. then there's mentors for you there. Exactly. So what are the, some of the things that Martin or other people specifically did mm -hmm. to mentor you? Um, a lot. Um, I, I'm fortunate that I get to work with um, just like Martin, Luis Fernando, um, and just the support that we get and the chances for us to be real leaders, to be put out on the spot and, and, and make these decisions to represent our organizations, to come here to learn about the the, um, about how we, we can continue to work, um, it's really important. I think that I was talking like um, this early this morning at the Young Leaders Initiative, we were talking about how important it is that we're giving the voice, that we're actually willing to express how much we care about the world, how much we care about um, having a better world, but we really need to have that opportunities, the collaboration between like today's leaders so that we can better become tomorrow's leaders. And, and I think that's, um, I found a place that allows me to do that. I found a place that allows me to express my voice and express my desire to, um, to work better for my country, but also to provide an example for, for others. Great, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So our next young, vo young voice is Joseph Apuku, who's a native of Ghana and an alum of the African Leadership Academy in South Africa. I hope he has a MasterCard in his wallet because in college he is a MasterCard Foundation scholar. He is part of MasterCard Foundation's youth think tank and he is in Oxford with us as a MasterCard young leader. <laughs> uh, he's working actively even while he's in school to help other young people in Ghana design and launch businesses in their schools and communities. He's in college at Westminster University in Missouri in the US, which some of you might remember is where Winston Churchill gave his famous Iron Curtain speech. And later Gorbachev um, gave a speech about the end of the Cold War. And after meeting Joseph, I'm pretty confident that one day people will say it's where Joseph Opuku studied too. So come Joseph. <laughs> I grew up in Mafia Didome, a small village in the Volta region of Ghana. Growing up, I would describe my childhood as challenging. I saw firsthand the vibrancy of a rural population walking several miles for water for domestic activities. Both the young and old were peasant farmers and grew just about enough to feed themselves and their families. There was no hospital, and so pregnant mothers could not have access to antenatal care. And when it was finally time for them to give birth, they resort to doing so at home. There was no primary school. And so to many children in the area, just like myself and their families, education was not an option at all. At the age of seven, my single mother made a bold decision that transformed my life for good. She became one out of 100,000 Ghanaians at the time who moved from various rural communities in search for a better life in, in cities. For me, this move has totally transformed my life as she navigated various menial jobs working in open farms to ensure that I saw for the first time in my life a classroom. I am here today because education has totally transformed my life. Fast forward into 2011, I started a book project um, that 
led to the donation of 300 books and provided tutoring services to children in the Mafia Didome community. As you may know, this helped, but then the greater systemic challenges of poverty, youth unemployment, hunger continued to persist even till date. Later that year, as was mentioned, um, I gained a scholarship to study at the African Leadership Academy in Johannesburg, South Africa. For me, as a young person, I believe that ALA presented me numerous opportunities for me to develop my skills and to meet young people from all over the continent and to rethink what I, what I feel my contribution would be like to improving you know, places like Mafia Didome. What if all young people could have access to the transformative education I've had access to over the years? What if economic opportunities could be presented in places like Mafia Didome to mitigate the challenges of rural urban migration? What if schools under trees were migrated or didn't exist at all? My name is Joseph Opoku, and I believe in a world where this are possible. I believe that the world can achieve all this. I started, I've started realizing some of these dreams through my work with Youth Impact Workshop, which is a platform where young people design, prototype, and implement solutions to problems their communities are faced with. In the coming days, I am starting the Youth Impact Fund, which will provide funding and training primarily for young people engaged in entrepreneurial activity in rural Ghana. In doing this, I am not looking forward to returning to Mafia Didome to donate books or to provide tutoring services anymore, because I would be working towards solving greater systemic challenges by developing entrepreneurial talent to take some of these challenges head on. I believe that Africa will change. I, I certainly believe that. And I believe that young people would surely be at the center and the, at the heart of driving this change. However, no meaningful contribution, if you ask me, can come if young people do not have the capacity or do not have the skills to do so. And so I believe that I'll continue to develop my own skills um, through the various opportunities I've been given so that I'll be put in a better position to help develop the skills of other people. My name is Joseph Boku, and this is my story. Thank you. I'll tell you how old I am. I'm 38. Can you tell us how old you are? 22. 22. OK. I wanted everyone to know that. <laughs> um, and how old were you when you started school after your mom moved? Um, I started at age 9. Age 9? Yes. And what grade did you start at age 9? Um, I started from grade 1. But then, so grade one. given how you know, things yeah. work in my home country, um, I started very old. And you, know, you could see my height at the time being in a classroom <laughs> with you know, K2 away, <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I just moved up the ranks pretty quickly because um, I happened to have grasped schoolwork pretty fast. I and believe so that. I just moved, <laughs> I got the promotions to ensure that, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm still in college at this point, yeah. Yeah, and then um, can you tell us, you talked about how influential African Leadership Academy was for you, but yes. what is it that happened there that helped you believe that you can change your community and your continent? OK, so I mean, at the African Leadership Academy, when I hear you know, stories from my colleagues, like Marvin Tarawali, who is you know, spearheading a whole educational revolution in his home country, Liberia, um, when I hear Bradley O'Paris that you know, ventures, you know, that makes retail very easy for people in Kenya, when I look at the various powerful stories of my colleagues and um, the kind of things they are doing all over the continent, I am very much empowered to know that indeed the, the future of the continent is bright. And even though I've done a few things in the past myself, there's more I can actually do to contribute to that greater change. And the whole leadership approach ALA takes, you know, because on our campus, we actually run student businesses and student enterprises. And so we're not learning leadership in, a, in the classroom setting where a teacher is just lecturing to you. We actually get to experience it. those. And I think that is what makes the model really work. So I have one last question. I did some Google research on you. Yes. And I know that you um, are very interested in, in using media to, to reach youth and change youth. You did some radio work in the past, I think. Yes. Uh, I can't believe we made it to our third speaker and no <laughs> one mentioned media or technology. I thought that's all you guys would talk about. So I'm just curious, why do you think media is such a good way to reach youth? I think it's important. Um, 
I, I spent several years working with the children and youth in broadcasting mm -hmm. on children and youth rights advocacy in Ghana. And I think that media is a very powerful tool because it helps reach a lot of people, um, I mean, across, across places like Ghana, um, both social media, radio platforms, uh, places where young people can capitalize on to create, you know, very high impact change. And recently, actually, I did um, research together with a lot of young people from different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and we asked young people, you know, what are the best ways that organizations can actually reach you to get you more engaged with the activities? And they said social media. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that for organizations in, in this room, if you're looking at working primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa and looking at ways to target young people, probably a newspaper is not the best way to do it. Reach them through social media and you'll be having greater impact with your work. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. So our last young voice today is from Noam Angrist. Noam is a data and research loving social entrepreneur living in Botswana. He's going to be spending a lot more time at Oxford in the future. He's a recently announced Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> 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 He graduated from MIT in 2013 and did a Fulbright in Botswana, which were, is where he found the need and inspiration for his organization, Young Love. So, Noam, let's talk about sex. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love talking about sex? Right? Uh, I think I found a way to save a million girls' lives, and it's really simple. Tell young girls in Southern Africa that older men are nine times more likely to have HIV. They think it's the total opposite. They think young boys, they're running around at the clubs, they have raging hormones, they're having lots of sex, they have HIV. Older men are wise, safe, mature, married, their wives have menopause, they don't have HIV. That's what everyone's telling us. Uh, we've done surveys with 42,000 kids in Botswana where I live, and over 90% of people get this totally wrong. Can you get to age 40 without being 21? No. Uh, if you could, that's awesome. Please share. That's, that's great. Uh, but you can't. Uh, and so if you're 40, you were once 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, all the way up to 40. You're at exponentially higher risk. So people are thinking about discrete risk instead of cumulative risk. Uh, and 45% of 40-year-old men in Botswana are infected with HIV. It's a pervasive myth. And if you bust this myth, you can reduce pregnancy, also a proxy for unprotected sex and HIV, by almost a third. Randomized trials, the gold standard in evidence, have showed this 10 years ago. And it was never scaled. This was shown, this dramatic intervention, which could have had huge ramifications, was shown 10 years ago and was never scaled. It's that year after year after year accumulating dust on a library shelf. I read about this idea five years ago when I was at MIT, and part of this very lovely but dust-friendly enterprise of research. Essentially, you discover cool stuff, and then it sits there. Uh, and I loved it. I loved the magic of taking data and numbers, turning it into meaning. I ran a lot of regressions in dark rooms at MIT. Uh, and you discover stuff. You could discover stuff that doesn't work, that does. But I felt like it wasn't very meaningful. Like my results were totally disconnected from the real world. So when I came to Botswana on a Fulbright to do more research, this time at the University of Botswana, uh, I saw things that made my heart stop and my mind totally race. Sugar daddies everywhere. Uh, older men who were giving young girls gifts in exchange for unprotected sex. And I talked to a young girl, a poet, and she read me a very moving poem uh, about an older man who had infected a young girl with HIV, a sugar daddy. And the paper I read at MIT invaded my brain. This dramatic intervention which worked could have saved the young girl's life. And I was like, here's this huge problem. And I think there might be a potential solution. And they've never met. I was like, this is my chance to not just do research, but use research to save lives. And so me and Moitepi and Brenda and Unami, the founding team, uh, we said, we don't need a dollar, we don't need a pula, we don't need a penny, we're going to start. 
So we pilot in clinics, schools, and we start an NGO called Young Love, dedicated to scaling HIV awareness programs shown to work to millions of youth scaled by youth. And it's been amazing. Even though sugar daddies is a very taboo uh, and uncomfortable topic to talk about, uh, the community has embraced us. Because backed by evidence, we're not in the business of feeling good. We've got a high potential solution, and we're in the business of doing good. Uh, and so what do we know? We know that giving relative HIV risk information can create real behavior change. But that's not enough. You've got to deliver it right. You can't send old, crusty officials to talk to young girls about sex. But as many of you probably know, it happens all the time. Uh, and so at Young Love, we do it differently. We scale messages by youth for youth. We harness the credibility, relatability, engagement, and pizzazz of youth for maximum traction. Our messages work, and our delivery model is maximized for impact on the youth. And we've learned some cool things along the way. Like I said, you can't just walk into this classroom with your proven intervention and talk to kids about sex. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's what we tried to do at the beginning. No one was talking. Uh, so what do you do? What would you do? And the solution's really simple. And it wasn't found in research. It was found in our youthful bones. An icebreaker. When I say young, you say love. Young, love, young, love. I didn't know if you were going to join me, so I had to call out for myself. Uh, yeah, simple. You're ready to talk about sex, or more ready. Instead of having kids just tell them the, the HIV rate by age, we have them guess it in small groups. They guess it totally wrong. They commit to it in front of the classroom. Then we do a drum roll, reveal the graph, gasps, physical gasp. They're shocked. Shatter expectations. They remember the risk forever. It's been amazing. We got a mandate from the Ministry of Education to reach every child in the country. Uh, and with a local staff of 50 young people, we've reached 343 schools and 30,000 youth in the last year. We've only been around a year. Uh, and we're hoping to reach 1 to 2 million more in the next two to three years in Southern Africa. So I've made a shift from an entrepreneurial researcher to a research-loving social entrepreneur. Uh, it's a small niche, but it's one I deeply believe in. I used to be enchanted by the magic of taking data and numbers and turning it into meaning. And as a researcher, I created meaning. Now I turn those results and papers into campaigns for millions, or soon will. And as a young social entrepreneur, I not only create meaning, I create real impact. Pretty sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. So there are organizations a lot older than yours with less sophistication in their approach or evidence base. Um, and I find your energy and passion extremely compelling. But you work in Botswana, where age actually does matter. Um, and although in the classroom, youth might be an asset, what about when you go in and you're talking to the Ministry of Health or government? How does youth work for you or against you in that situation? Wow. Uh, it's an intense question. <laughs> uh, and we've gotten many bizarre looks, me and my team. Uh, and my, my development manager, Unami, actually sits on committees with, with very high-level folks in government. Uh, and when we walk into a room, people go, ah, these guys don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and so it's been a big challenge. Uh, and I think we've managed to, to do well because what we're doing, and when you see it in the field, we actually we invite folks who are skeptical, and not skeptical, but especially skeptical, into the field. They come into the classroom. They see the kids' reactions. They go, whoa, you guys kind of are onto something. And so we don't just talk, talk, talk about it. We say, you don't believe us? Come and see it. And so we are able to schmooze and convince people to see it in action. Uh, and when that happens, it clicks. And then that's, that's when we, we get the credibility, not because of our age or wrinkles, not that old people have wrinkles, but, uh, but because of, of the sheer proof of concept of, of what's happening. Makes sense. So there was a good article in Foreign Policy recently called International Development's Awkward Phase. Mm -hmm. um, and it talked about how everyone speaks so earnestly about challenges with youth and how important it is to invest in youth and address unemployment, address sexual and reproductive health. But nobody actually does it because it is messy and complicated. But right at the time when people are about to become healthy and productive adults, maybe, is when the sector doesn't invest as much. It's easier, and there have been real gains from investing in vaccinating kids, for example. 
Why do you think the international development sector doesn't invest in youth? Hmm. Or do you think they do? Maybe you think they do. And, I, and I, so I guess there's two ends. Why, why would you invest in someone beyond the youth and before the like, adolescent youth uh, phase? I think sometimes people think that that kind of slightly beyond teenager group, it's, it's almost too late. Like what's happened, happened. But that's, that's not true. Actually, most pregnancies uh, happen in that age group in, in Botswana, right? And that's a key debilitating factor. That's when you're dropping out of school. Uh, and HIV infection rates are 5% at the 15 to 20 year old range, and then they shoot up to 45%. Mm -hmm. So it actually is the critical window. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think when you just think about behavioral change and how people's habits uh, formulate over their life, you think it's too late. But when you actually look at what's happening at that age group, it's the critical time. And it's when those messages are most salient. If you tell a nine year old, don't have sex, you know, they're like, what are you talking about? Or maybe not four, five, six, but at, you know, at like 12, 13, 14, 15, they're like, whoa, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's salient to me, and like, well, maybe there's a way I can save my life and get an education and, and, and have a, a better life that I deserve. So what's it like for you to be younger than the people on your team? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so I'm younger than most of my amazing staff, uh, and it's exciting. I think it's really exciting. Do you think they uh, think it's exciting? <laughs> uh, I think they think it's uh, shocking. Um, so I was just having a conversation with my research manager the other day, Sidi, and she was like, I can't believe you're so young. How old are you? Uh, 23. 23. And um, there's, a, there's a quote that I really like that, that we say in Young Love, because we say it as an organization, but also individually, it's not the years in your life, it's the life in your years. Uh, and so we believe that really deeply. And for us, it's all about what you can do, not how many years you have you know, on your life scale or what have you. So it's not the years in your life, it's the life in your years. Thanks, Noam. Cool. Thanks. So now we're going to invite our three less young luminaries to come on stage and have a conversation about youth leadership. Take a seat anywhere. Yeah. I'll sit here. So I'm really happy to have three truly global leaders in this space on stage. We have Asan Jamil. Asan is the CEO of the Aman Foundation in Pakistan. They're focused on systemic change in health, education, and nutrition. And one of the programs we're most interested in hearing about today is uh, focused on vocational skills and training for youth in Pakistan. We have Fred Swaniger, the chairman and founder of African Leadership Academy, which we've heard about already today. Uh, he was ranked among the top 10 young power men in Africa by Forbes magazine. And he has been leading a quiet revolution, grooming the next generation of Africa's Nobel Prize winners, policymakers and entrepreneurs. Uh, he has an MBA from Stanford Business School and worked at McKinsey before he embarked on this journey. Uh, he was selected as an Echoing Green Fellow almost 10 years ago, and since then an Aspen and TED and every other kind of fellow too, so it's great to have Fred here. Um, and Pamela Hardigan, of course, many of you know already. She is our tireless and fantastic host in Oxford this week. She's director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Said Business School. In that endeavor and her previous work, uh, setting the strategic orientation and mission for the Schwab Foundation since its inception, really, um, she's widely recognized as a global leader in social entrepreneurship. So it's great to have her perspective represented, too. Thanks for being here. So Fred, let's start with you, since we met Joseph. <laughs> Um, what is it that is happening at African Leadership Academy that gives us Joseph and makes people believe that they can change their continent, even if they're from rural Ghana? Um, well, Joseph said everything he wants to say. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, um, what we believe at the Academy is that uh, a lot of people who change the world start young. Uh, so if you think about um, Martin Luther King got the Nobel Prize when he was 35. So that means he started his activism 
pretty early. Uh, Nelson Mandela was 21 when he got involved in the ANC Youth League. Mark Zuckerberg, 17. Malala. Malala, exactly. So, um, but, uh, w and what I believe um, often happens with, all, with these three people is that, uh, sorry, these, in creating these people is that three things come together. One is uh, you have someone who has potential. Uh, they get the opportunity to practice leadership from a fairly early age. And the third is someone gives them an opportunity. Um, but uh, very often, these, this thing happens by chance. Uh, and uh, there's too much luck in the process. And um, what we try to do with the academy is to bring some more structure and actually create a systematic way of bringing those three things together. So we find young people with potential that we think have to become leaders. We give them systematic practice in leadership through as much experience as possible, you know, real hands-on. We don't teach them leadership in a theoretical sense, as Joseph mentioned. And then we give them opportunity by plugging them into networks. Because no matter how talented you are, no matter what your skills are, if you don't have access to the right net mentors, you don't have access to the right partners, you don't have people who can invest in you, you won't be able to take the skills that you have and actually scale them up. So we basically try to create a cauldron where we put all these three ingredients in, and then we let the magic happen, and then you know, thousands of leaders like Joseph are going to come out. Pamela, can you remind everyone what the mission and approach is at the School Center? Yeah, well, perhaps I should start by saying that um, it's very interesting to be an entrepreneur within an 800-year-old university. Um, when I first came to Oxford four and a half years ago, I remember somebody telling me, um, have you heard the Oxford joke? And I was like, no, yeah. How many Oxford dons does it take to change a light bulb? And the response was, change. Um, <laughs> so with that, I sort of you know, held my breath and thought, well, this is a very interesting challenge here for somebody who it does is about systemic change. Um, I think that what the Skoll Center is trying to do within the business school and throughout Oxford, let's start with the business school. We have the opportunity to actually bring these two worlds together, which is we have always separated, this is where I make my money, and this is where I do good. And those two things absolutely have to come together if we are actually going to survive on the planet and continue to have you know, a, the kind of life that we want for our children, our grandchildren, et cetera. So our entire focus is on really building business leaders and leaders across Oxford who are going to really look at the world, not through the separation, but to bring all of those pieces together. The Skoll Center basically has three pillars that it works on. It's nurturing leadership and opportunity. The next one is, we don't call it research, we call it producing actionable insight, very much like what we heard in terms of you know, how you link research with HIV and have actionable insight that people can actually use. Um, and the, uh, the last one is, of course, things like this, where we have the opportunity to share knowledge, um, vision, passion, and um, opportunities with one another. So that's really what we do. Um, and uh, I've got to tell you that it has been a fantastic four and a half years from the point of view of really having the space to be entrepreneurial within an old university. The great thing is, it's so chaotic here that nobody tells you what to do. So you can pretty much do whatever you want. So Pamela, I want to ask, we just heard from four incredible young people. I think everyone in this room wants them to succeed. In your, from your perspective, what is the skill gap that usually prevents people from realizing their ambition? And how are you trying to address that at the well, school Well, actually, center? it's very similar to what Fred was talking about. You really do need the mentors. You need the opportunities. You need, and one of the things I think that, um, that, that especially when you come to Oxford, or especially when you come to the MBA, one of the things that I've learned about the way the MBA has been structured is that people come for a year because, well, certainly in gen you know, generally in MBAs, because they think, okay, this is gonna open doors to other opportunities to pursue careers in the business space. And so the way the career system is structured is you can have investment banking 
or you can have consultancy. And all of a sudden, we're seeing that completely shift and say, I don't want to go there, really. There might be some, obviously, that still do. But they really want a completely different kind of frame. They want to work for, as I say, organizations that are fundamentally innovative, philosophically positive, and morally compelling. And so your careers office, usually, in the MBA programs, don't offer those kinds of things. Um, that, to me, is a huge gap within the kind of things that we provide. It's really where are those new spaces where uh, young people can really fulfill uh, their dreams as well as pursue career opportunities that, um, that, are, that are going to you know, give them a livelihood. Thank you. Nisan, your focus is actually very different from Pamela and Fred's. And you're trying to address the same challenge in Pakistan that Misan is working on in Nigeria. Um, there's a big difference between developing world-class leaders and just making sure people have jobs. But one of the things that Misan talked about was how important soft skills are. Can you talk about vocational education and soft skills as it relates to your work? Yeah, so um, firstly, it's really odd for me to be with the elders, because I'm the youngest of nine, so <laughs> I feel like I'm your age. Um, <coughs> so. Um, yeah, so Aman Tech, which is our vocational training institute in, in, in Karachi, uh, has about 3,000 uh, kids in there. And initially, when we started it four years ago, we took in kids that were from very uh, humble backgrounds and were actually failing in the school system or were not being able to uh, you know, uh, do very much with the, what, you know, their interest levels in school. So we took them in uh, into a program which we, we, we took in the city and guilds system of of training, which is you know plumbing, air conditioning, refrigeration, welding, auto repair, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, so that was, and, and we said that we'll help them find jobs at, at the end of this international accreditation. So that attracted them in, uh, and of course, in addition to the City and Guilds accredited program, we also taught them another language and we gave them computer skills. But what we also understood was that the mission is transforming lives, and uh, yes getting livelihood, getting skills, uh, getting into the job market where you have demand-driven skills is very important. But the real uh, focus for us was soft skills and is soft skills. And so I, I, I bring a mental health background to my work. And so we had mental health counselors in the Vocational Training Institute looking at soft skills and actually developing a curriculum that uh, was uh, relatable to the set of problems that these young uh, kids had. And so, you know, the soft skills program looks at how do we, how can we teach optimism? How do we look at building attitudes? How do we recognize what is energy sapping behavior, what is energy giving behavior? And ultimately, you know, that attitude is the key thing that we want to, to build in these young, uh, you know, future workforce people. And one of the things that uh, became a cornerstone of what we uh, trained them for is that relationship building is fundamental. And the cornerstone for relationships is trust. So things like what is empathy, uh, what is, you know, how unconditional respect and regard is, is critical, and yet being authentic at the same time. So those three things actually are the cornerstone of, of uh, a relationship, a working alliance, and teamwork and what you use to build trust. And so these people, we, we prefer the one year long course because it gives us more time for this to mm -hmm. sink in. But you know, market uh, requirements sometimes make us do three month, uh, six months courses. So now what we're doing is putting it into the pedagogy of the instructor as opposed to having it just as a separate uh, lab and a separate s set of sessions. So um, to us, um, attitude, is more important than the computer skills. computer skills, how well they speak English. Mm -hmm. It's, it's what, how they relate to people. Thank you. So I, I said at the beginning that at Malago we're obsessed with scale. Um, and I, we do think context matters. And training future leaders is very different than delivering fertilizer or vaccinations. Um, but I want to understand how, how all of you think about scale, but I, I think for Amman Foundation it is also different than it is for Pamela and Fred. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about scale, and I'll love you forever if you talk a little bit about cost. Um, but um, we're all interested in how you're thinking about the scale of 
your program or how scale comes through the leaders you create. Let me go. Sure. sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think for me, the, the way I think about scale is um, I really believe that we are creating the scale makers. Um, and uh, you know, if you, what, if you create 6,000 people like Joseph and you know, all his colleagues, and then they go out and this one tackles problems in healthcare, and this one tackles education, and this one tackles governance, and this stuff, you know, then they are creating and impacting the lives of millions of people through their work. So that, for me, is the one way in which you think about scale. We also think about scale in terms of spreading ideas. So we are hoping to, because what we do at the academy is actually, you know, it's, we have a, a nice facility, um, but I always believe that great education and great development of people is not about the buildings you have, mm -hmm. but it's really about your philosophy. Um, and if you, if you have a great curriculum, great philosophy, you, put, you have great students and you great, put great faculty together, you can have them under a tree and you'll have a great institution. So we hope that other institutions around Africa that have less resources than us can you know, borrow ideas and, and that philosophy and hopefully you know, that's another way to think about scale. Um, but um, you know, more recently as well, I've, I've, I've started thinking about you know, how do we actually um, take some of the work we've been doing um, and I think uh, advances in technology have, uh, are bringing about new ways of, of, of developing people. So, um, you know, because to create one of these young leaders um, in our two-year program, we spend $30,000, actually $35,000 per student per year. Um, and so it's quite an expensive thing to do. It's difficult to scale that, uh, especially in a, in a, as a nonprofit. So um, what I'm now doing is um, taking um, the model of what we, in terms of how we develop leaders at the academy, and, trying to, and we're going to do it at a much larger scale in tertiary institutions. And so starting something called the African Leadership University, uh, where the idea is to build, uh, the vision I have is to build 25 campuses across Africa, uh, and each campus with 10,000 students. So we have about 250,000 at a time. Um, and uh, with um, the same um, ethos and you know, how do you train leaders and entrepreneurs in the, and, uh, and getting them to collaborate across countries, et cetera. And we believe we'll be able to do this um, at a cost of about $5,000 per year for both tuition and accommodation. Great. Mm. Um, I think that one of the issues that um, comes up when you talk about scale is that we immediately think of the global company. And we sort of think our organizations need to become as big as ExxonMobil, Coca-Cola, et cetera. And we focus on scaling our organizations when what we really are doing is tackling issues. And in order to tackle those big <coughs> issues, we can't possibly do it alone as a university, as you know, any one of these academies. We need to form a movement around, this, uh, around the issue rather than the organization. I think that one of the things that we are very excited about, I keep telling the Skoll Foundation that the initial investment they made in the Skoll Center was probably the best investment they ever made. <laughs> Humble me. Um, <laughs> but the reason for that is because we actually operate on a very low budget. We support every year five full scholarships for social entrepreneurs who have actually started their organizations and have grown them, and who want to come to do an MBA um, to give them the increasing business tools that they're going to need to make sure that they can go out and create more organizations. But there's something really funny that happens with those five. We now have a community of 52 Skoll Scholars. And as I said on Monday evening, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Skoll Scholarship. They act as an infectious agent. It's an incredible virus that spreads throughout the university, which is an excitement around, I want to be part of this movement. And so when you look at it in terms of dollars and cents, we might be spending about 50,000 pounds a year on each one of those individual scholars. But the multiplier effect of what they're doing for the thousands and thousands of students at Oxford is incredibly exciting. So for me, that is where we want to you know, look at scale and the work that we do at the Skoll Center with other universities and other learning institutions is also about joining up so that we can spread that virus, um, which is fortunately a virus for which there is no cure. Once you're mm -hmm. infected, you're dead. <laughs> Thank you. And so, Asan, 
for you, scale is very different. But you said right. you're working with 3,000 yeah, people so, right now. Yeah, so, There's so, a lot more to work with. Right? That's right. So, so you know, for 3,000 uh, kids at the Amantech Center right now, the ambition is that just this campus, we should be able to get them to 5,000. And our estimation is that the cost per yeah. year would be about $1,800 uh, per student. And uh, the idea here is, of course, uh, that the government uh, is beginning to take note of uh, what Amantech is. And the potential that we see for scale is actually replicating Amantech institutes uh, all over Pakistan. And you know, the ambition is a 1,000 of them in a country of 185 million people, where 70% of the population is under the age of 30, uh, a thousand vocational training schools would perhaps make a dent. So what's your uh, biggest constraint to doing that? So it's, I, I think it's engagement with government because they have the resources. Uh, they, are, they also actually have lots of brick and mortar that can be taken up by us mm -hmm. and put in the quality of the work, the, the blueprint. We're, we're in partnership with City and Guilds and GIZ of Germany. So what we and the soft skills part is what we want to keep embedding into everything. So uh, you know, on the one hand, that to me seems like uh, a pathway. Uh, but we are also getting inquiries now out of other countries, like Algeria is uh, asking us to come and set up Amantech over there, because you know, youth opportunity uh, has to be an upskilled opportunity, and not everybody is going to make it to colleges and universities. And perhaps not everybody should. And so this is about taking not just, so, so the one aspect is vocational training and scaling it. The ultimate goal is to take vocational training and embed it into the secondary schooling system. Mm -hmm. Because the secondary schooling system in Pakistan in particular, and other countries like Pakistan, actually has a much lower enrollment rate. And the reason for that is people are not seeing the benefit of that. So if you have skills training happening in there, then parents are more keen to have their children go to school because otherwise the opportunity cost of going and working right. is, is a hard one to trade off. So I see vocational training both as something that will widen the opportunity for young people to not just have to go to universities, and you're not just leaders by doing that, but you're actually being able to, uh, and depending on that phase of life, where you may not want to be so academically oriented. And the Germans and the Swiss have done this uh, you know, ex mm -hmm. exceedingly well. So, you know, in Pakistan, we're trying to build for better because when many things are broken, why not take the best ideas, blend them together, put in the soft skills. Some of these soft skills are not even there in our, in our best schools and colleges. Yeah. So I, I think there are many things happening. You're scaling, but you're also infecting the system with new standards and qualities. Yeah, I think you're all doing that in some ways. So one of the things I find interesting is that we always think of leadership and development and skill gaps with youth. Um, and I'm sure there are, there's someone in this room that's twice <laughs> Joseph's age that might have less developed leadership skills than Joseph, even possibly. So what are the, some of the things, Pamela and Fred, that you think you're teaching in your programs or at your school that are ageless in some ways, that are relevant for anyone sitting in here that still has a lofty dream and wants to achieve it? Oh, you know, I gotta say, I'm really tired of the idea of leadership. It would be so nice to just have some really great followers. Um, <laughs> and you've all seen that wonderful little YouTube video of whatever his name is who gets out there and says, you know, leadership is overrated. It really is the first follower. I think that um, one of the things that we try to emphasize more than anything is that leadership is about you know, humility, leadership is about listening, leadership is about empathy, leadership is about, you know, insp inspiring. And I think that it's very, very difficult when you come to a place like Oxford, which is, you know, got such brand recognition and you're doing an MBA where it's all about you to, um, you know, kind of focus on what are the real qualities, very much what you're talking about in terms of the soft skills. Um, that, to me, is a real, really important point. And I think that through some of the uh, projects that we do here um, at Oxford that we've developed at the, in the MBA school really are tackling those issues in terms of you know, entrepreneurial projects that build teamwork, the um, you know, leadership for impact is much more about, again, leading in terms of teamwork. And we don't do enough of that. Fred, would you add anything to that? 
Um, yeah, but I'll say that the, one of the things that we do at the academy is really encourage our young leaders to work in teams and to collaborate. Um, and, um, and I think that um, in doing so, it gives you an opportunity to really ask for feedback from your peers and people that you're working with about how you are coming across, how you're leading. And I think that's a lesson that you need to keep applying to yourself as you grow. That's, in fact, that's the only way that you grow as a leader. Uh, and you know, constantly reflecting and asking for feedback and using that to change the ways that you, you, you do things. And, and the other thing that I think is relevant from our philosophy with the, the academy is this notion of practice, um, that constantly practicing um, what it means to be a leader and think about how the practice you're getting is preparing you to do something uh, bigger and bigger. So you know, if I think about my own example, um, you know, when I was 18, my mother had started a school in Botswana and um, my dad had just passed away and she had four kids to look after, so she, she put me in charge as the headmaster of the school. And she, she said she, she could keep running, uh, working as a teacher. And uh, you know, it was a small school at the time, 35 kids. Um, but that gave me the practice to seven years later when I was 25 to think about creating the African Leadership Academy. And then that has given me the practice to now, and that, you know, at the academy, we're looking at creating 6,000 leaders for Africa. So going from 50, 35 to 6,000, and now I'm thinking about creating this, I'm working on this university system that's going to create 3 million leaders for Africa, right? And how do you think about constantly reflecting back on what you're learning and, and the unique opportunities and experiences that you've had? How does that prepare you to do something bigger and bigger on a larger scale for the world? And that, that, that is something that I don't think you can ever stop doing. You're a great example of that. So let's invite, we have not much time left, actually. Let's invite our young leaders back on stage, and we have time for <coughs> questions if people have them. This is being live streamed, so make sure you wait until a microphone gets to you before you ask your question. I see someone right on the edge there. You guys scoot in, it's okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, is this on? Yeah, I'm Janet Longmore with Digital Opportunity Trust, DOT. And um, my questions are for Nissan and Jamina in particular. Uh, I thought all of you were fabulous. And uh, we work with thousands of young leaders. And I'm particularly interested in, in the role models that so many young women have become. And I'm encouraged by their talent. So in your journeys to date, have you found any challenges as, as a young woman? Or have you just plowed right through it? Or what, what does that mean to you? And do you feel that you are role models uh, for other young women, social entrepreneurs or young leaders? Hassan? <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I think challenges in the doing business in Nigeria, doing, doing business in Africa, and, and the context of just being a assertive woman, um, I've learned a lot from that experience. Um, I think treating people um, the way you expect to be treated, um, with that courtesy, with that respect, regardless of what you're getting back, um, has been something that I've, I've grown in over the last year and a half. So people will write you off, but I, I do really believe at that human interaction level, I want people to connect with me because of what's in here and not because of what's on a CV. So I will hold that trump card as the very last thing I use um, to sort of end a conversation and hope that that will, will, will sell and connect. But really, it's, it's connecting with people just because of what's in here. And usually, you find that if you offer that leaf of saying, I'm going to treat you with courtesy and respect, this is the idea that I have. Can you connect with it before you try, try to throw out, oh, these are all the accolades and the things that I've accomplished and all the scale and blah, blah, blah. Um, because humility in the African context, I mean, people will humble you. They don't care if you've gone to Harvard. They don't care if you've gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. They will put you in your place. I mean, one of my favorite stories is my, one of our, our first set of students. Um, there's a lot of skepticism in Nigeria because of the brand and reputation we have internationally around fraudulent activities. We are actually the most skeptical <laughs> and hardest to be fooled. But I remember this group, first class of students all sort of being very anxious. Like this woman says she's going to not sleep until she gets us jobs. Hmm. 
Um, and someone stood up in the class and he said, oh, but you know, I, I Googled her and it seems she went to this Harvard place, which I've heard of, so maybe she's not going to steal our $60 and run off with it. Um, and, and maybe she'll actually do what she says. And they all looked at her and they looked at him and said, what are you talking about? Please, those are the biggest crooks for all we care. We don't. So, so Nigerians, Africans will humble you if you think that you're bringing all of that to the table. Um, and, the, and then the, just the last thing is, is really around knowing your integrity, knowing your moral compass, knowing what you will stand for and what you will not stand for. There are lots of things that we want to do with the government in a big way, but we're not gonna compromise on our moral compass. And so until we learn how to do it and we have the right contacts in there, it's been a challenge as well. Um, so in terms of role models, looking, looking um, across at just finding role models in every interaction, really looking at people for what they have. Any other questions? Well, yeah, um, um, that was more in the same way, um, I think that role models, um, we can become role models are very important. Um, and I don't, uh, the way we uh, are identifying or sorry, learning to become role models is by the people that we are working with. Um, and um, just by being, by, by those connections and being in, um, being motivated by the innovation and by the passion that our, the people that we work with are working is how we're becoming. Uh, this question is for all of you. And I'm curious if there's, this might be kind of challenging, but if, if you could give kind of a one sentence answer to one thing that you look for in your mentors um, or that you had in a mentor that you've already had so that people in the room that are thinking about mentoring us young people um, can kind of hear what are the things that are really valuable in those mentors. But it's for everyone, because I'm curious what mentors you guys had when you were starting out as well. Let's take, let's take two other questions too, and then people can answer a couple of them right here. Amandeep, you hear me? No. no. Should I just shout? We can hear you, talking to it. Okay, um, along the same vein, I was wondering what organization or, or um, project within an organization has empowered you the most so that we who are trying to empower others can see what's been most beneficial within your trajectories? Great, and then one more here. So, go, so going, my name is Simon Bell, I work at the World Bank. So going beyond empowering just you four and actually empowering the youth of Africa or the youth of Latin America, we have a global problem of unemployment and it's falling disproportionately high on young people. Um, it's very clear that governments are not going to employ young people. The private sector is failing at that job. So it seems that entrepreneurship in all its forms, social entrepreneurship, any entrepreneurship is what's going to be incredibly important for young people. But school systems don't teach people business skills. They don't teach people so soft skills, particularly in the developing world. This is a ser serious issue. But the huge benefit, there's a huge benefit to this. Young firms are known to employ young people. So if we can get more young people establishing new young firms, we're going to get more people in jobs. Uh, how do we do this? How do we get there? This is critical for the, for the world. OK. So does anyone want to jump in on any of those three I'll jump in on the mentor and uh, your question. I think mentorship is a two-way street. This idea, and it's very much the same thing along empowerment. You don't empower people, they empower themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that the same thing with mentorship. The best, uh, I, I have always shied away from that because I learn more from my students than they would ever learn from me. So I think that that's a real two-way street. So when I look at those, I've had people come and say, will you be my mentor? I'm like, no, you know. I've, I will have a conversation with you and we'll learn from each other. Um, and I think that in terms of empowerment, the most empowering organizations are not organizations, they're experiences. I mean, all of us have had our road to Ma Damascus moments where we need to expose ourselves to things that make us incredibly uncomfortable because we're not used to it. And that is a very empowering uh, situation to be in if we are able to come through that. I totally agree with your observation in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, uh, there are organizations such as the ones that are here represented, as well as junior achievement, et cetera. Where are we going to go with this? You know, uh, there are so many, so many young people who want to go and be their own boss and be their own 
uh, you know, set up their ventures. How are we supporting them? And I think that there is a movement now to do that, um, but it's just beginning. No? Yeah. Yeah, so is this working? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, sometimes I yell, so I just want to check. I used to be a rowing coach, so I just I have to make sure I'm not yelling. Um, so, so for me, one, I have three that I feel are empowering, have been empowering to me and, and hopefully transcend to, to many people. One is tough love. Our name is Young Love, but tough love uh, in the sense of things that are hard to hear but very important. So I actually, there's one statement that a mentor of mine said to me, I think it was six years ago, and I still remember it to this day. I was writing an essay and like a mini proposal, and there was one comment that said, you are no Edgar Allan Poe. And I was like, OK, I'm not an Edgar <laughs> Allan Poe. But then there was really great feedback after. And, and you know, not easy to say. It was kind of funny, too. But uh, very memorable, tough to hear, and, and important. Uh, and then eventually, I edited it into something that was worth something. Uh, and then that's on tough love. And, and there's many examples of that. Another one, and I think a very complimentary piece, is trust. Um, and so, you know, once you, you give guidance, then trusting the person to, the young person to, to take that or not take that uh, and do what they think is right uh, and, and experience it. Um, and so, for example, our first grant as Young Love, we, we worked for six months with no funding, uh, was just a 20K grant. And it's like, you know, here you go, we love your idea and good luck. Uh, and we're here if you need advice. Um, and uh, then the third one is experience. Uh, actually doing something. So again, not just looking at a textbook. So for me, one of the things that's enabled me to, to be more successful uh, and, and happier with the work that I'm doing is I actually started a smaller NGO uh, when I was at MIT. And that experience, I carry so many lessons from that. I don't carry a lot of the econometrics classes with me uh, to my work. But, yes, but, you do. Uh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that. Uh, but, uh, but yes, that experience of actually doing something uh, is really important. So I just wanted to say a couple of things quickly about, um, you know, jobs. Uh, jobs are created by entrepreneurs. We, we understand that. And I think in every initiative, for example, at, even in the vocational training, about 20 to 25 percent of the uh, students or the graduates are encouraged to, to actually start their own businesses. But Junior Achievement, which is a program that we've also launched in Pakistan, as well as, uh, um, um, am I forgetting this? So Teach for Pakistan is the other one. But no, Junior Achievement, in the name of Injaz, is actually collaborating with the Vocational Training Institute to give those skills. I think one of the, one of the earlier speakers in one of the earlier sessions talked about how important it is to, for us to not try and reinvent the wheel, mm. but to actually back a lot of these programs and connect them. So I think there's a lot of work happening in entrepreneurship, but it needs to be taken to the right places and connected and brought to people that are you know, in, in, the, in the throes of wanting to take charge of their lives. I think that's right. And that's exactly what we're trying to do at the School World Forum. So thank you all for being part of the session today. I think this session is about dreams as much as youth. Um, and I don't know at what age people decide it's frivolous to say I want to change the world, but clearly everyone here still does, no matter what age they are. I still do. For me, that's through the portfolio and fellows that Milago supports. But I hope everyone on this stage keeps dreaming bigger, and I hope that for everyone in the audience, too. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you.